Welcome to Bond Park. 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 I'm Marshall Ward. And I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And on tonight's show, we have Mike Farwell of the Mike Farwell Show on 570 News. Mike is a huge community advocate. He's the voice of the Kitchener Rangers. He's a radio broadcaster. And uh, he's the one behind Farwell for Hire, the campaign that's uh, all about finding a cure for cystic fibrosis, one odd job at a time. Yeah, we recently had the opportunity to be on Mike's show. And Speaking with Mike, you just feel so much at home. He was a very generous conversationalist. And actually, the day that we recorded this episode was back in September, and he was fresh off of an interview with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau during the last federal election. We're very lucky that he made time for us that day. Yeah, I'm so, I so much admire just how tireless Mike is. Yeah. And I'm really excited to have this hour with him. Yeah, I am too. All right, let's bring him on. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here in Bond Park. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> so I'm going to come out and say the obvious. You've had a busy day. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a day that you don't necessarily expect. Uh, and it's funny. I, I sent my beloved a text as soon as I was finally coming home, which was just before 4 p.m. So when you get to the station at 6 a.m., which is my arrival time to get ready for a 9 a.m. show, and it's what, 10 hours later that you're leaving. It's not extraordinary in broadcasting, but it was extraordinary for today's purposes because there was an interview with the Liberal leader, who also technically is still the Prime Minister. We, we try to be careful of that during election campaigns, not to uh, give one you know superiority over the others or anything. Anyway, and yeah, that just becomes an entire whirlwind unto itself. It takes almost 24 hours just to get scheduled and then the day began with security sweeping our studios before 7 a.m. And the rest, as they say, is history. It was a whirlwind, to be sure, but in all the very best ways. For anybody who doesn't know, why don't you tell us what you do? Uh, I talk on the radio. I do I do exactly what we're doing here, yeah. but I, I get a studio virtually to myself, and they actually give me a paycheck every two weeks to do it. It's not a very lucrative paycheck. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I don't know if you saw the 10-year-old car I drove up in. No, I did not. But uh, it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a job just like this. And, and they gave me a show called The Mike Farwell Show, which I've been hosting for a little over two years now on 570 News. It's part of a 24-year now journey in broadcasting that I wouldn't change one single element of. And, and here we are. The checks haven't bounced and they have not yet caught on that I'm a no-talent hack. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh so hard at that because that's how I feel in every asset of my life when I'm trying <laughs> something new. Um, I know Marshall's been a caller on your show before. Do you want to talk a bit about that, Marshall? Yeah, I love the Mike Farwell show. It's yeah. such a good show. It's, it's just packed every, every day, all, every weekday with such great content. And um, I think of it as this, uh, this ongoing, constant kind of conversation with your community is that how you see it like that you're it's a back and forth uh, conversation with the place you live in I don't think I could have described it any better so thank you for that and yeah. if I can get a copy of that audio clip I may use it for show programming purposes <laughs> oh, we've used stuff but from guests too it's okay <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly the way I, I view the show and in fact I was just talking at lunch uh, at a meeting about that very thing about how truly when I began this show and I, I was given a whole lot of latitude for which I'm eternally grateful to my employers uh, in June of 2017 to assume this role and and, and kind of uh, build a show the way I wanted it to be built and, and I work with a tremendous team of producers two guys that are right there with me the whole way and and we mandated from the get-go that if the majority of our content is not local 
then we're not doing this right. And so that can be from anything to bylaws on municipal streets to parties on Ezra Avenue. I mean, there are there are so many things we could talk about the you know the the, the transit projects that we need to get done on the on the Waterloo Toronto corridor, etc. There are big things and there are smaller things, but there are so many things to talk about in this community. And I firmly believe that my role is to facilitate the conversations about the things that are happening around here. You guys talk about really really big things and really really small things sometimes too absolutely yeah your producers are fantastic it's uh james sebastian scott and (laughs) paulie and they're great um personalities in themselves when they they're there talking to which also just adds another dynamic to the show not only do they do their jobs paulie on the technical side and james in terms of putting the show together and getting us our guests but yeah they can come on as sort of characters on the show as well. And I don't mean that in a performance-based, uh, phony way at all, that they have personalities, they oh, have they're opinions, they have, they, they're both hilarious, yeah. and that just is a, is a great foil. And, and every once in a while, when we're talking about really heavy stuff, like, I don't know, opioids, for example, mm-hmm. uh, you can use a little bit of time to not be so serious. And again, these are two guys that are passionate about the region where we live. Uh, one of my favorite things about Paulie, I think he once described him as like, he could be a character from Seinfeld. Oh, he completely <laughs> could. Not only is it one of his favorite TV shows, but that guy is just, yeah, he is hilarious. Sometimes unintentionally, which yeah. I think is the funniest kind of person. Oh, totally. <laughs> or, or you'll mention some movie that you would think everybody has seen and Paulie hasn't seen it. Yeah. The funny thing is I tried to get him one day. I did this thing called pop culture or pop quiz. And so a riff on pop culture. Plus it was an un planned quiz for Polly. He didn't know it was coming. And and he actually identified, like I gave him characters. If, if I'm Maverick and Goose, where will you find me? And he was able to come up with Top Gun. I didn't think his pop culture knowledge even went that far. <laughs> so I'm going to dig a little deeper next time. But yeah, he, he has very limited knowledge of pop culture. I kind of love that. There's a comedian named Tig Notaro. Um, I think she's also a radio contributor and a, and a writer. And anyway, she has uh, this show. Um, <laughs> it came to her partner's attention that she knows nothing about pop culture and so she now has a show called under a rock and faint super famous people come in people who are current in tv current musicians um, celebrities personalities whoever they are they come in and they sit with her and they have about a half hour and she asks questions and they answer them and she has to try and guess their name everybody knows who's sitting in that chair and she has no clue and that's the whole premise of the show and i'm wondering if your if your partner (laughs) can maybe do that that would probably be our polly (laughs) absolutely yeah it's amazing (laughs) this career that you've carved out for yourself it it would appear that you've just like built this momentum up you know you've been hanging out in this community for this long working really 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 hard and I don't know if you can even see it when it's happening, but you're, you know, you're building this listenership and you're building these relationships and your, and your names out there and uh, to the point where you can do something like Farwell for Hire. And uh, do, do you feel like you've seen this along the way, how you, you become a local celebrity. You know, you're a, a, like a, I see you as a community leader. You know, you're an advocate. Yeah. But, but do you realize it's happening while it's happening? I have to be honest with you, and, and, I, and I promise uh, this is not humble brag in any way, but I'm, I'm so uncomfortable with the word celebrity, and it gets thrown around a lot, and, and I, I understand it. I mean, I can be in line at Tim Hortons, and somebody can stop you for a conversation, mostly positive, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> So I, I understand where that comes from. But to answer your question, Marshall, no, you're hitting it right on the head. If I had a if I had a master plan when I started out in in broadcasting in June of 1995, uh, this might have been it. I d- I don't know, but I I could never have really drawn the steps or or connected the dots. And there was absolutely there there hasn't even been, well maybe maybe far well for hire was a bit of an aha moment for me to recognize okay, something is happening here. There is this momentum that's been gained. But to say that I planned it or I recognized it as it was happening. Absolutely not for even one second. And I've said many times and will say again, I would do my job. Like I, I would love to do the job that I do, whether people listened to me or not. Right. The, the trick of it all is, of course, they have to listen to me or I don't have a job. Right. right? But I just I enjoy what I do so much. And I'm just so fortunate that, yeah, something something caught something stuck somewhere along the lines a lot of it i think through sheer good fortune on my part and 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 here we sit today still still making a living at it i think that's really true that you do get 
what you give, um, if you're if you're giving into your community with the heart and soul that you do, that that's going to come back to you in a positive way. And mainly because your eyes are open to positivity. So you're going to be open to those opportunities that are presented to you. I noticed today that you have 104% of your goal reached for I know. Farwell for Hire. How I does know. that feel? It, well, it's just, it, when, and when you say it, because this whole thing, and, and Sarah, you, you hit the nail right on the head when you talk about being open mm-hmm. to positivity, looking for positivity. I, I've said so many times that, yes, I deliberately began volunteering many, many years ago, uh, but I've realized since beginning to volunteer time that I feel selfish, that I get way more out of the volunteer experience. I was literally sitting here trying to pay attention because I wanted to say when you're done, I want to talk to him about how selfishly wonderful I love to give time. Exactly. Because it makes me feel good. And it, it, so what if it's selfish, right? So what if that is a selfish feeling that it makes you feel good for giving? You're putting that out there and that's going to come back to you even in that wonderful fulfillment that you get from that. And that has come back to me 104% uh, over, yeah, over, right? Really because has. that to me is absolutely the reason that Farwell for Hire, this goofy idea I had to raise money by performing odd jobs in exchange for a donation to cystic fibrosis, mm-hmm. which is my favorite charity. It's it just the, the people that I have met, the lives that I have touched through my own volunteering, it's just, it, we've got this group and I, I, I do believe it's relatively unique and special to the region of Waterloo. I, I mean that sincerely. I've worked uh, in, in a variety of other places, including Toronto, Thunder Bay, out in British Columbia, a little place called Salmon Arm. And there is nothing like this community. Maybe I'm a little biased because I did grow up here, but the way this community has taken on my cause as kind of their cause. Yeah. And now we as a region were are are recognized as one of the the leading communities in all of Canada when it comes to raising funds for research into cystic fibrosis. It's incredible. So I think Waterloo we region. deserve a high five. We here, totally right? do. I'll high five that. <laughs> I'll right do here. it. There we go. <laughs> so Absolutely. since we know what Farwell for Hire is, do you want to explain to our listeners in case they don't, in case they want to reach that? What is it? One hundred and ten percent goal. One hundred and fifty percent goal. <laughs> I don't even know. There's going to be a goal attached to it ever again. I was so stressed out this year when we ran the campaign. But yeah, as I said a moment ago, it was a, this goofy little idea. So cystic fibrosis. I'll give you the full background. It's yeah. very near and dear to my heart because two of my sisters had cystic fibrosis, and I have to use the past tense because they passed away. Still to this day, there is no cure for cystic fibrosis. The research that has been done in the 20 plus years. In fact, it was just past the 26th anniversary of the passing of one of my sisters. Uh, The research that's been done has been so incredible that we are absolutely extending lives now. Uh, A child born with cystic fibrosis today, the median age has crossed 50 for the first time in our history, which is, it's absolutely amazing. So this is something that has been a part of my life and really not something when I was a much younger man, I gave a whole lot of thought to. It just kind of became the routine. My sisters, uh, Luann and Sherry, who were two of the five kids in our family, just had to do had to do their thing. Their treatments that are required to keep the symptoms of cystic fibrosis at bay. The and treatments, they're quite cumbersome, yeah. Yes, especially yeah. I'll tell you. This goes back to the 1970s mm-hmm. now, when my sisters were born, and in fact, my oldest sister Luann was born in 69. Sherry was born in 75. And yes, they were much more cumbersome then than they are now, but they still remain an interruption to your day, to your life. What you're doing is uh, compression exercises to, uh, or there's equipment that helps you do it, that or percussion, not compression, pardon me, percussion to keep the lungs clear of mucus. Mm-hmm. And then you are taking a variety of enzymes or pills, as we always called them, to help you digest your food because cystic fibrosis primarily attacks the respiratory and digestive system. So... For my sisters, yes, it was a it was a machine that made an awful lot of racket, and I look back and feel a little bit guilty for complaining about, hey, you're interrupting the Dukes of Hazard yeah. right now, you know, with your lousy, noisy machine. Well, Bo but and Luke Duke, they deserve some respect. I thought so, <laughs> yeah. right? And Uncle Jesse and all, yeah, Cooter. So anyway, <laughs> might be crazy, but I ain't dumb crazy, <laughs> Cooter coming at you. Yeah. So I, they, they had to do these treatments twice a day. Another part would be... Uh, what essentially looks like an oxygen mask mm-hmm. filled with medication. And then for my sisters, it was handfuls. I mean, literally handfuls, 30 odd enzymes per meal, wow. more than a hundred a day. So we've 
come a long way in reducing that. We've got far more effective medications and so on and so forth. But this is a roundabout way of getting to far well for hire, just right. pointing out that this is something that's just been in my life. So getting back to that volunteering aspect as well, I'd been involved in radio for quite some time. I lost my sisters, uh, and it was it was a bad calendar or 12-month period for the, the Farwell family. My oldest sister, Luann, passed away in September of 93, and then it was just nine months later that we lost Sherry uh, in June of 94, and she was only 18 at the time, and it so was, hard. yeah, it, it was. Uh, it was a, a real shock for Sherry, for sure. Luann lived to be, at the time, life expectancy, and she had gone through all of the traditional final stages that you'd, you'd expect. If you read the textbook, it was Luann. Yeah. Sherry kind of caught us all off guard, and Anyway, so there was there was a period, obviously, of, of coming to terms with that and dealing with that as a family and for me personally. So it was many years that I kind of just distanced myself from all things cystic fibrosis. And when it finally occurred to me that, you know, there's there's more to life than going to the radio station every day and doing your job and trying to earn money and, and want to give back, the first place I thought of, of course, was cystic fibrosis. So I had, I had just been reading a, a biography of of Roberto Clemente, of, mm-hmm. of all things. I'm a bit of a baseball fan. And when it's not hockey season, love me some baseball. And there was a quote in there. I, I, what I didn't know when I started the book was that Roberto Clemente was such a tremendous humanitarian. Mm-hmm. I, I thought he was one of the best Latin American baseball players to ever play the game. And I find out about all, all of his humanitarian efforts. And there was a quote. And, and Roberto Clemente said, a person who has the ability to help others and fails to do so has wasted their life. And that really made me stop and read the page again and read the page a third time and let this kind of sink in. And I started thinking, well, the hell can I do? Like, really, I'm a, I'm a radio announcer. That doesn't come with a lot of transferable skill. So I went back to cystic fibrosis and I said, hey, I'm a talker. I can talk in front of a crowd. Maybe you need an MC for an event. Maybe you need some help with this or that. And that was kind of the beginning that's of it. That's how you started and then? That's yeah. absolutely yeah. how I started. And you'll you find out very quickly, going back to our earlier point about getting back what you put in, uh, there are myriad organizations that would love to have somebody handle the MC duties oh, totally. so they don't have to, and they don't have to speak in front of the crowd, and et cetera, et cetera. So that was the very beginning, and lo and behold, I stayed obviously on with cystic fibrosis for many, many, I still am with cystic fibrosis all these years later. It's probably 15 years now since I went back. But I got kind of tired of annually coming to my friends and family around our big walk, yep. which happens on the last Sunday of every May, like so many organizations do sponsor me for the walk, make a donation to the charity. And I had this idea one day and I thought, I wonder if this would work. And, and I kid you as the day is long, it started with one tweet. If I could go back Twitter, Jack Dorsey, help a guy out. I need that tweet. I remember tweeting it at the citizen of the year dinner when uh, Liz Whitmer was being recognized. Mm -hmm. I, I I remember it all. And I, I sent out this tweet. And I put on the hashtag Farwell, the number four higher. And the idea was just as I said before, it's I'll do an odd job. You make a donation to my charity. Simple as that. And I didn't know if it was going to work. It, I, it's absolutely genius. Yeah, well, like, the, the, the genius is in the stupidity of it, yeah, I think, right? It, aren't most ideas? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The genius is in the insanity. Yeah. And, and that was the very beginning of it up until that point. When I grew weary of just asking, I had done various stunts, like, you know, I'll sit in a dunk tank. Mm-hmm. I, I boxed Fitz the Whip Vanderpool for a charity <laughs> event. I jumped out of an airplane. I'm like, okay, no, no. <laughs> yeah, what's next, right? Yeah. So uh, anyway, that, that very first year, I thought, man, if we could raise 10 grand, that'd be pretty cool. And we raised 20. Amazing. And then every year since then, it's been six years consecutive. We have surpassed the goal that we established at the beginning of the month of May, because I do it through the month, which is Cystic Fibrosis Awareness Month. And you talked about that 104%. Mm-hmm. That was on a stated goal of $150,000. It's and amazing. Yeah, we came in at just around 156. It's crazy. It's great. It's crazy. So what are for, for people that don't know, what are some of the jobs that you did? You name it. Like, yeah. honest to goodness, I'm, I'm looking outside at your beautiful deck as we speak <laughs> right now. Thanks. I have power washed oh, decks. Oh, have you really? Yes. Yeah. I, I have helped build yeah. decks. I have mowed lawns. I have weeded more gardens than I knew existed. And I hate weeding gardens. Who doesn't? Right? Yeah. That's why the campaign works. Because in May, springtime, what do people <laughs> want to get done? Hey, I know somebody that'll do it. All we have to do is give them a donation to charity. And so I've weeded all kinds of gardens. I've washed a lot of cars. I've done things that I 
sort of regret with I, farm animals. I thought animals. that's what you were going to say. But yeah. I'm like, where is he going with this? That's true. <laughs> I, I cleaned the sheath of a horse. And I'll just encourage you or invite you <laughs> to look that up sometime yeah. because I had to. Yeah. And the person that had asked me to do it, I got back to her and I said, you know, this looks like something maybe a veterinarian should be responsible for. She says, oh no, horse people do this all the time. So I put on so the latex horse person. Club. I guess I am. <laughs> Bailey and I are still speaking. I call every once in a while to make sure. I put on the latex glove, applied the lube, and <laughs> inserted my hand in the appropriate place to do the job. Yeah. Well, what, how much did you make for that? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect answer. I should have you write my newspaper column, which no. you're fully capable of. Oh, Marshall, yeah. you're far yeah. better at that than I am. <laughs> do you feel at this point that you've met the city? Like, or do you really feel connected even more so than you did before from yes. through this project. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that is one of the best parts about it, Sarah. I get asked all the time, how do you do it? I don't know how you do this. Because it in truth, like this is legit. This is me showing up at your place in my grubbies to do whatever it is that you've asked me. And when I first started doing this, I was doing a morning radio show that went from 5 a.m. until 9 a.m. And Again, I will thank my employer until the end of time for allowing me the latitude to, during the time of this campaign, not only to promote it on the air, right. but moreover, during the campaign, I sign off the air and I go to work. So there were times where I'd be getting up at 3.30 to go in and do my radio show. And don't feel bad for me on that score, because while it's early... I don't do anything. I sit there in an air conditioned studio. I make some jokes. I go home, but I would That's go out. It then. Lightly, it's, I <laughs> but I, I would sometimes go until 10, 11 midnight, mm -hmm. sleep for a few hours and repeat, but with the full backing of, of my employer. And Amazing. yes. And, and so to, to your question about meeting the community, is it tiring for sure? But do I get energy from the people that I meet and the things that they do like honest to goodness gracious, the generosity just there have been times where I have all you knock me over with a feather when I get checks for five hundred, one thousand dollars from people's houses. Thanks for helping, you know, put the 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 mulch around the base of my trees on my nice property out in St. Clemens. Here's one thousand dollars. Who does that yeah. for two hours of labor? Somebody did. Yeah. You know, so it it's just absolutely incredible and it gives me so much energy. So my real crash only comes in June when it's all when over. It's and over. that's then, you know, because the momentum's all gone. Oh, You're sure. clearly doing something to attract people to you. Yeah. Like, uh, and I think um, that only really truly happens when somebody's intentions are pure, right? When they're, they're doing it from the right place. That's when you attract people to you. I really think so. And people who will support you. Well, I have to give credit again to... The, the place where I work and it was, it was my boss at the time. So they'd always given me opportunity in the month of May to talk about cystic fibrosis and talk about the big walk that we do and mm -hmm. raise money or raise awareness. And he came to me one year and said, Farwell, you got to tell the story. And I said, Oh no, 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 this isn't, this isn't woe is me. This isn't gloomy. This is, Hey, let's raise money and, and get a cure for this disease because you know, hundreds of children in our community are still suffering. He says, you got to tell the story. And so that year, the, this is before Farwell for Hire, mind you, but that year for the commercials that we recorded for the walk for cystic fibrosis, I, you know, hi, I'm Mike Farwell. I lost two sisters to cystic fibrosis. That changed the channel. And, and it, it's funny, it wasn't a woe was me story. It wasn't as though people were all crying. They're just like, no, I can relate. I feel your pain. Bingo. I've been through something similar. Oh my gosh, there's somebody out there like me. It's it's 100% being able to relate to somebody and say, oh my God, I'm just like Mike Farwell. And the I'll one, give him my money. The <laughs> one that got me was the assistant trainer with the Kitchener Rangers because yeah. I, I do the play-by-play -play for the team as well. And I'm so I'm around the team during the season all the time. We ride buses together. We're like family. And that year, and I'd been doing this for several years, and he hears the commercial, and the next time we're on a bus trip, he says, Mike, I, I didn't know. I said, yeah. I And I, I'm not embarrassed by it, I, I, but again, I just didn't want it to be a sad experience. No, and I'll, I don't want to interrupt again, but uh, like I've we've been through some stuff too. My husband actually lost two brothers to cancer. Um, 
very painful. So right away I can see in your eyes that you're relating to that feeling that yep. he's been through. I lost my dad when I was really young. Um, and I make this joke with him, with my husband all the time, that we have to comfort people who hear the news. So when somebody hears our story or when somebody says, oh, what, what does your dad do? Or well, what's, what are, what's your family like? See, what are your brothers like? And you have to tell them a story and you see the compassion in their eyes. It's our job to comfort them through our story because they feel for you. Do you know what I'm saying? It's a great way to look at it. Well, it, there's no other way to look at it. I see the pain in people's eyes and they're like, well, it's okay. Don't feel bad for me. I've moved, here's how I've moved on. And, and you know, they had lived a great life up until this point, et cetera. So have you felt that before going through this or is it sharing that story was just part of getting to this next point with your cause? Yeah. I think it's a little from column A and a little from column B so? for sure. Yeah. I've my, my favorite uh, encounters during this campaign are other either families who are living with cystic fibrosis today or the actual patients. One, one fella, I love him like a brother. His name's Jeff Allen. And he actually went to clinic with my youngest sister, oh, Sherry. Wow. So, and I'm not going to lie. There was a part of me for half a second that thought, well, hang on a second. This ain't fair. Yeah. You guys were in the same clinic in the same place. He showed me the picture. She's gone 25 years now and you're still, but that's a natural feeling. He, yeah. Anyway, and, and the guy, he's just, he's, he's incredible. And he's a, he's a testament to, uh, obviously the work that's been done and he's a little bit luckier obviously as well, but anyway, and he, he's just, he's a tremendous human. And I'm so glad to have met him through this campaign because people are just, I, I think because I have been willing to share my story, they're willing to share their, theirs, in, even if they're living it right now and the pain is still very much real. What else I think has happened here is... Uh, and this is through listening to the Mike Farwell show over the last two years and listening to a lot of callers call in, not just guests, but a lot of callers on a segment called Rant and Rave. Right? Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. a good one. Yeah. That is and, a good one. And and what it is is this. I think Mike's emotional emotional intelligence is off the charts. Yeah, and he And he can speak to any person who calls in. And the way you treat people and the way you listen, that's what I think is truly working here for you. Um and it's it's a it's something it's, I think of it as a as a gift. It's a personality trait. It's a sign of incredibly strong character. But it's also something you have to work on because no doubt you find yourself in situations not necessarily on the radio, but with people who are just kind of uh, maybe draining you because they want your time, and you're doing something that's making them feel good, and you're you just keep giving it and giving it and giving it. I don't know how you you don't get drained from that. I I do. Uh I, I do try to manage it as best I can, but sort of coming back to, to something I was saying earlier, uh, not wanting it to, to sound like humble brag at all when the word celebrity is used, but I do recognize, and, and the reality of my role is that people, I, I do need people to, to be listening, and, and in order for them to, to want to listen, there has to be a connection with them. You have to make a connection, and it's not like I'm deliberately trying to I'm not trying to manipulate anybody I'm just me but I recognize that those who then want a bit of that time or a, a piece of something it's because there's a connection that's been made mm -hmm. and that's what we're here to do quite frankly it's I, I guess in, in a sense it's my it's my profession but I think as, as people isn't that what we're all just kind of here to do we're here to connect to each other cell phones and text messages be damned we are here to yes. make human connection. So I, I try very hard to manage it, but I can tell you I'm not very good at that management because I, I do feel if somebody has taken the time to, to reach out to me for whatever, they, that's an effort on their part. However small, if even if it's just an email, I'm not hard to find online, yeah. even if it's just a tweet, but they've made that effort. Who am I to say, I don't have time for your whatever, your request. So it can be it can be challenging. It can absolutely be draining. But heck, I, I kind of feel like what you're doing is uh, so. This may seem like a big jump here, but um, so uh, we have some real huge celebrities in the world, like mm -hmm. Bruce Springsteen and Bono, who have garnered the respect of pretty much everybody. I think right? absolutely. So what happens is if something comes along, like just before the president's presidential election, before Donald Trump was elected, uh, Bruce Springsteen said some things like. Mm -hmm. um, we got to bury these ideas, put this down, you know, don't do that. Would, and, and Bruce is one of those few people that Trump can't send off some snarky re reply saying you're 
wash up, washed up rock stars. Like who's gonna? It's what, country what, will turn what on. Can you, <laughs> what can you say <laughs> against Bruce Springsteen like, and yeah. Bono, right? And and Lady Gaga now, right? And uh, that's a powerful, powerful place to be in, where your voice can means more can do something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and it's part of that connection, though, right? Yeah, for sure. It's part of and all the work they've done. Exactly, yeah. and uh, it's people feeling like you've been respectful, so they can take that moment to call in with a rant or rave, or sometimes both, as they say. Well, yep. I think it's a bit of both, is what I was hearing today. <laughs> yeah. um, and as Marshall was mentioning earlier, um, maybe it's that five. Six percent of people that that call in that uh, maybe you don't make the time for if they're if they're not being reasonable just or maybe disrespectful, um, but I think the majority of your callers are there to make a point one way or another. As a listener, also what I, what I know listening to the Mike Farwell show is, I'm not going to have to endure if somebody's right. rant is going off the rails. I know I know Mike is going to put it, mm-hmm. an end to that quick, so it doesn't feel like an endurance test for me as a listener. I know we'll be on to a new caller pretty soon because Mike's only going to listen to something that doesn't seem to have a direction or, or just repetitive. It's an interesting dynamic to be sure. And I have a love hate relationship, but mostly love with open line radio. Cause it's just, I, I always describe it as walking the high wire without a net. Because you just don't know what yeah. you get. I think it's incredibly brave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just you click a line uh, on a computer screen, uh, you know, lines one and through you six, don't know and what's it, coming in. There's a name on the oh, screen. Oh, you're just gonna hang up on me like you did last time. That's how, <laughs> so, that's how some of them start. Is that start. you calling Marshall? No, <laughs> but that's how some of them start, right? Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and the truth of it all is, maybe, maybe three. I think people I have legitimately, okay, enough out of you, mm-hmm. right? And uh, you know. My, Listen, everybody's, I try to, I try to meet them where they're at, you know, and, and if I can steer things back on the rails and obviously if it's too far out of whack, then that's why the button is there in my hand that I can click and say, okay, (laughs) we've had enough of this and we're just going to move on. When I was looking you up online and I was reading your Twitter bio, I had a moment of, um, I don't know, peace. I, I just felt a connection to you and we hadn't met yet. So your Twitter bio says, I make my living sharing opinions on 570 News and the Kitchener Post. Sometimes my opinions differ from yours. That's okay with me. Is that okay with you? And I think anybody can read that bio and decide if they're going to follow, not follow, comment, not comment. And I think that's what we all kind of need more of online is this is my space. This is the, These are the types of things I have to say. If you're willing to have an honest, open, intelligent conversation with me, I'm here. If you're not, feel free to move on. That's kind of what I get from that. Are you finding there's a respect for that bio or do people just sort of, (laughs) this is Twitter we're talking about. Exactly, I was gonna say, that's a Twitter bio. You remember that, right, Sarah? (laughs) Yeah, Uh, no, there is no respect for that, but it was clearly written with intent. And and I've got to say, I have a a love-hate relationship with Twitter as well, mostly hate, to yeah. be perfectly honest with you. And I, I still remember, oh my goodness, I was, a, I was a reluctant adopter of the medium, but I was working for a man who was insistent that it was the next best thing. So I'm a little bit old school when it comes to the job that I do. Uh, and, you know, for, for some of the youngest people that we work with now, 24 years would sound like a forever time, but I'm still, you know, mid late ish forties. I think I've got a lot of runway still ahead of me, God willing, but I don't know if you watched the HBO show, the newsroom that was, uh, it was an Aaron Sorkin show. So while, but it's, it, anyway, it's about a, it's, it's really just about a news outlet that decides to do things differently. We're just going, we're going to do the news to inform people again, ratings be damned. Like we're not going to do infotainment. We're going to do hard news and do it right. And blah, blah, blah. Sounds great. So (laughs) I'm, I'm a bit of an old school that way. And, and so this, this boss and I, uh, we, we would butt heads quite a bit over, you know, bells and whistles. He loved sound effects on the radio station to draw people's attention Mm -hmm. to things and this and that. Anyway, so Twitter came along and he's like, everybody has to get on Twitter. I'm like, well, why would I do this? Like, I'm a radio broadcaster, et cetera, et cetera. And he's describing the scenario whereby, well, if there's a bank robbery downtown, somebody could be inside the bank tweeting about the bank robbery. I said, well, how do I know that that person is actually in the <laughs> bank and reliable? Because this is the old school in me yeah. coming out and vetting sources. Uh, by, by mandate of the boss at the time, uh, we all had to get 
Twitter accounts. And so I began that Twitter account. I think it was back uh, around 2008 or nine. But anyway, that's, that's irrelevant. But the, I, I was reluctant. And then I did find early on that actually it's a very powerful tool. It is and, and going back to what I said about Farwell for Hire earlier, I kid you not, it started with a tweet. As much support as I've received from the radio stations over the years, the very first year that I did Farwell for Hire, and essentially the second year as well, there have been six years of it, it was all conducted on social media. I tweeted about it. I start. I posted it on Facebook, and it just, it just, it just ballooned. That's all that happened. So I respect, I respect fully the power. But unfortunately, to me anyway, over over the years, it has just become a place for people to sit there and and, and type things that they would never, absolutely never, say to somebody to their face. Mm-hmm. So back to the bio and your original question. Can you tell how roundabout I can get? Like I, I, I intend, you always come back. I intend <laughs> on talent. answering, but it, it touches <laughs> on what Marshall was talking about earlier. And those, uh, you know, the days where you're kind of feeling like, okay, I've been pulled in a few too many directions. I, and it's part of my OCD in my personality. I felt the need. I was compelled to answer every at mention I had, right? right? No matter how argumentative or vile or whatever, but finally, I'm like, this is just, I'm chasing my tail. I'm losing. Like, I just can't keep going down this rabbit hole. So the bio essentially, listen, you can disagree with me. And if you want to be disrespectful, that's fine. But don't expect me to continue to engage. I'm sharing my thoughts. I'll respectfully dialogue with you if this is the place you'd like to do that dialoguing. Other than that, let's move on. And that's the whole message that I got from that short, succinct bio. You're clever. What, well, no, it's written so cleverly <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It really lets you know right away that that's, that's what's going on. Um, but I do want to make the point that, of course, you're, you're talking to um, people people's level of respect online and you know hiding behind the, the uh, protective gate of a, of a keyboard where a lot of people say things that they normally would not say in person. It's hard enough to say everyday stuff in person as humans. But the people who are doing that... Uh, they're, it's like, do they not have the awareness that what Mike Farwell is doing takes enormous courage? Well, no, I think that they do. Like, I think, I think, <laughs> I think very often that troll is. Sorry, I, I, I feel bad even saying that. I don't love that term, but I think that that person making that awful comment is actually just looking for a connection. They're just looking for someone to respond, somebody that they could maybe talk to back and forth for a little while, and maybe fight with online. I think, as sad as it is, I think that person is looking to connect with another person and engage in a little bit of a fight. Might that's, not be a healthy no. connection, but that's what I think is happening. That's exactly how I feel, and I'm mm. with you on the word troll. I I rarely, if ever, use it because I'm with you. I don't I don't like the word at all. No, it sounds it sounds awful. It does. Yeah, and you're you're labeling somebody who who might not even really know better. Psst, this is an ad. This episode of Bond Park is brought to you by Wordsworth Books, located in the vibrant heart of Uptown Waterloo. Celebrating 35 years, Wordsworth Books remains dedicated to stocking the very best in new Canadian and international fiction, thought-provoking nonfiction, cookbooks, DVDs, and a carefully curated selection of children's picture books and young adult novels. Co-owners Mandy Browse and David Worsley are happy to special order any title you're looking for and pride themselves on being able to obtain the hard to find, and the out of print. Along with organizing between 15 and 20 author readings and other events each year, Wordsworth Books supports numerous book clubs for literary fiction, sci-fi and fantasy, mystery, books for babies, and several food-themed reading groups. Support a local gem like Wordsworth Books, which is so much more than just a great bookstore. It's a -a one-of-a-kind gathering space and a vital part of the region's cultural community. Follow Bond Park Podcast on social media and enter to win our Wordsworth Books giveaway. Trust me, it's worth it. Find Wordsworth Books online at wordsworthbooks.com or on Instagram at at wordsworthbooks. That's W-O-R-D-S-W-O-R-T-H, books. I'm going to tell you a quick personal story about Wordsworth Books. Last summer, my 11-year-old daughter asked me to order the Divergent series for her by Veronica Roth. And I thought, okay, kid, I'm going to do you one better. I'm actually going to call Wordsworth Books and see if they can get this in for us. And of course, David said, no problem. We'll call you when it's ready. Well, that call came in a couple days after my mother passed away. Had we ordered those books online, they would have showed up at our door. We would have stayed home. But that day that we got the call that the books were in, we headed uptown to pick them up. We ran into a really close friend out front who gave us the hug that we needed. And then we actually ended up staying uptown for the Buskers Festival. It turned into an experience instead of something that we just ordered. And there's a big difference. And that's why I like to support Wordsworth Books in Waterloo. Not only did they have what we wanted, but they actually ended up giving us what we needed. (laughs) 
I listened to a show recently that I thought was uh, really interesting in what some of the men were saying when they were calling up. So I can't remember the full opening of your show or whatever, but it was about how um, in 2019, aren't we done with men doing things like cat calling and stuff like that and like whistling at women and making any kind of mm-hmm. comment like, please tell me we're, we're done with that. And you get a guy call up and go, uh, yep. Oh, yeah, I do that sometimes out the window, you know, just a compliment, right? Mike goes, yeah, that's not, that's yeah, not I'm just that's paraphrasing awesome. it. That's not right. I can't. It never was right. right. <laughs> never was right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And Mike, Mike posed the question, do you have any kids, right? Yeah, I have a daughter, yeah. right? Would you do it with your daughter in the car? Well, no, no. right? But this conversation has kept going in this circle about, but it's perfectly okay. I just yeah. wouldn't do it with my daughter in the car. And Mike goes, well, why wouldn't you do it in the yeah. car? Well, I wouldn't want to see her, me doing it. Like, So it's not all right. Anyways, these... <laughs> Your show can be so enlightening that way that, yeah. you know, I hear some of these listeners and I go, wow, there's not only are there still men out there who are doing this, but they somehow are calling up to justify it. It's really, really enlightening to me. When and I think if they're doing that, they probably don't even know that they're calling to justify. They probably are thinking, well, I'm going to call up and I'm, people are going to know, obviously, I'm doing it for... That we've gone too far the other yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and what they're looking for is a justification of that behavior, Right. And they're hopefully not receiving it on the other end. Did I do an okay job at trying to explain you, that, Sean? Actually, yeah. you, you hit, you nailed it. It was mm-hmm. perfect. And it's funny because that's the line that I'm always walking. And, and again, completely and utterly selfishly, I want everybody to listen to my show. I want every single person in this community and beyond to listen to the Mike Farwell show. For sure. And I will get feedback from people like this gentleman who's calling up and he's angry at me for saying, listen, like we're past this, right? The whole woo woo is like, that's done. That's, that's so 1980s, <laughs> maybe definitely yeah. the seventies, but the, you know, and then I've got the other side of the spectrum and, and a lot of them on this side of the spectrum are people that I know and really respect. And they're like, I, I can't listen to your show because a guy like that's going to call your show. He's listening to your show. So I can't possibly associate myself with him. So what if we're different? If we were all exactly the same, this would be incredibly boring. Something like your show facilitates the ability to have those different opinions together and make it into a conversation instead of this is my camp, this is your camp, and hey, why don't we build a a total wall in the middle? And if I can bring that back to Twitter itself, this is what we all know Twitter has become. Those who wish to find arguments can always find arguments and they can also find people who are speaking their exact same language. So what you do is just get an echo chamber. Twitter gives you the ability to follow who you want. So you will follow people who are like-minded and you will share those opinions and it just, you start to think it becomes that little bit of a mob mentality, right? You're all, oh, everybody thinks this way because all of my 15,000 Twitter followers oh, feel that way. That's all I see online. Exactly. Well, that's all you are seeing online. So <laughs> to, to the, the line I'm walking on the air where I want everybody to listen and people that I respect say, I can't listen to your show because you have guys that want to cat call and defend cat calling on your show. I, I, my position to them is I, I get that and I get that it makes you uncomfortable. However, isn't it important that we know that people like this person exist? And maybe not even so much exist, but exist in our community. Like and, they, and, and, it, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, paint it as the the worst offense anybody could ever commit. But I think we have to recognize, no matter how progressive we want to be, or how progressive we think we are, if mm-hmm. we stay in our little progressive circles, that we've got another big group that we might want to pull along with us if we want to be progressive. And if you stop listening and you don't call in, then that cat caller isn't going to hear your opinion. Or isn't going to hear the story about when it happened to your daughter when the two of you were sitting in a car and somebody yelled into your car. Um, I want to be careful, too, about when you're talking about it's not the worst offense ever to maybe catcall or behave inappropriately. It's not. We're, let's not be crazy about it. It's not the worst offense ever. But it is quite obvious that that type of behavior condones a culture of, well, if that's okay, then these other eight things are okay. And Bingo. my buddy does them, so I'm going to do them. Or my dad taught me, or my brother does it. And that's what starts that kind of a community. So to have a well-respected local celebrity who's out in the community doing things to help one another and to help everybody in the Warley region, 
to show that this is your opinion and that you say it's not okay, that's important. I hope so. It is. And I've, you know, I, I've never thought about it until this moment because I, I can tell you, uh, I've, I think it's only the one thing I've done with intent on the show. And that is baseball diamonds at Waterloo Park. Mm-hmm. When we got wind that there was going to be a redesign and they were going to be removing some baseball diamonds, which just to me, and I'd, I'd gone through every report and it just didn't make any sense. And I'm like, for the love of God, Waterloo, like figure this out. You're making a huge mistake and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I built a case, but I, I got so passionate about that. I remember telling James and Polly, guys, we're, we're going hard after this and we're going to, like I, that was the only time I can remember that I've deliberately tried to move the needle on something. I, if, if my taking a stand against catcalling does move the needle, that's fantastic. But I, I, I can't possibly think enough of myself to think that, oh my gosh, if, you know, it's, it matters as much. I hope it does though. If it, if it helps the conversation, that's I'm great. I'm telling you from the other side of it, it matters. Good. It absolutely matters. I think something else that really matters is having a, your segment, um, Ask the Chief. So mm-hmm. Chief Brian Larkin from Waterloo Regional Police. I believe police everywhere are trying to make a better connection with the community. And uh, and in Toronto, I know they have more of them in neighborhoods, certain neighborhoods and stuff. And, uh, and for me, I can literally feel it transforming my feelings about police. Uh, listening to your show for an hour and Brian Larkin doing his very best to answer questions, talk about many different issues. And one by one, hopefully people can... Uh, build more trust for the police or have a better understanding of what the police do and the leadership behind, behind it. And uh, I think that's a really powerful thing you're doing too. You know, I think we have Brian Larkin to thank for something like that. Mm-hmm. Agree or disagree, you got to respect the man for sitting down for an hour mm-hmm. live on the air once a month and taking questions, much like me on a daily basis. When you never know what you're going to get when you open the phone lines, yeah. neither does the chief. And he sits there and he takes it. And it's important too that he's just able to provide some messaging to the community about more along the lines of what policing is like. And I can't help but think back to the Dukes of Hazard reference I made earlier, child of the 1980s television wise, right? Mm -hmm. And so Miami Vice and all these other shows about cops and private eyes. And I'm like, this has got to be the coolest thing ever. And then I remember being in college and I used to work for B and D deliveries, huh. which was yeah, you've maybe used their services from time. Do you to know time. what I never did? But there was always the talk that it might happen sometime. <laughs> but we, I don't yeah. think we ever did. No. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's beer being delivered to your home after hours. Yeah. Is that yeah. what that was? Yeah. Well, it's not not really after hours. No, oh, we oh. were we could not keep any supply. It was right. against the law. But our last call would be pretty hairy, and that's where my story is going to go because <laughs> okay. we'd all like all of the drivers would be outside the beer store at 5 to 11 before it closes and the dispatchers would just be sending off. And this is back before we could send them by pager. So we're on two-way radio. This is the original Uber It's drinks. so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. And so we'd be running in and you might leave with six or seven different orders. Yeah. So yeah, it might not arrive at somebody's place until well after midnight, but I promise you that beer had to be picked up or the liquor, wherever we happen to be, before the store closed because we couldn't, we couldn't have it on, in stock anywhere. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not legal. So I remember after my last call on a Saturday night, and I happened to be downtown-ish Kitchener, and I was coming home along Sterling uh, past the Stampede Corral mm-hmm. at Sterling and, and uh, Cortland. And I, it, it, nothing against the stamp. Don't get me wrong. It, it, was a, it was a great place, and it's a place that I think many of us have fond memories of. But as I rolled past there that night, about 12.30 in the morning, and I saw four cruisers lined up, and so clearly something was going on. But it, it just occurred to me, out of the blue that night, if that's your job and you're on the downtown beat and every Saturday or two out of three Saturdays, this is what happens. How does that frame your perspective of our community? Of the community, Right? Because yeah, yeah. that's your, it's like the, let's go back to the echo chamber on Twitter. Everybody thinks the way I think. Well, it's because you're following people that think like you, right? I just, I wondered about that. And then I started thinking more and more. And I remember as I got deeper into this job, uh, hosting talk shows and whatnot. I, I talked to, I'll never forget his name, Gene Silva. Sorry, Gene, I've forgotten your rank, but he was the head of cybersecurity mm-hmm. at Regional Police. And, and he was on a show I was doing at Rogers TV for a while. And we went out for a drink after the show. And I said to him, I said, what's this? Like, he's investigating some of the most horrific online crimes we could think of, right? Crimes against children. Yeah. He's got a family. I said, Gene, how do you, how do, you do that? 
like the stuff you must have to see. I couldn't imagine. So long way around this is I think policing kind of sucks. Like as much as I was a kid and thought I wanted to be Sonny Crockett or yeah. Magnum P.I., I don't think there's a whole heck of a lot of glory in policing. So they have my utmost respect because you know what they're not doing most days? Running around catching bad guys. Yeah. Do you know what they are doing most days? Responding to domestic disputes. Yeah. Helping people who are in dire need on our streets. That's what their days are like. Forget solving crimes and catching bad guys. It's just, I don't think anyway, that that's what policing's all about. So that's why I think it's amazing that we've got a chief like Brian Larkin to share those perspectives. I really do too. I was blown away. I called in one time. You can ask him anything really. Yeah. yeah. And I asked about uh, the history of the, the henchmen, a motorcycle gang that was around in my childhood. I think my kid oh. are almost the exact same age. And yeah. It must be because I remember the henchmen too. Like yeah. out Old Highland Road. Oh, yeah. yeah. Highland. That's oh, yeah. right. I just knew we lived in Forest Heights and it was late seventies, early eighties. We had free reign of that whole area as yeah. youngsters. And I knew there was a certain point on Highland, a certain house I wasn't allowed to go past for that reason. They would take out a newspaper ad every year at Christmas time, mm-hmm. full page ad that had their like ominous symbol on it. I said, we're still here and always will be. And <laughs> my, my dad would show it to me. I don't think I've ever it would, it would give me goosebumps. That's I'd be like, amazing. Yeah. And my mom would drive by the house and say, that's where the henchmen live. And they'd be like, Doberman's barking. Mm. It's like, it's looked like something out of a movie. It was all boarded up and, Anyways, uh, Chief Brian Larkin gave me the most honest response, you know, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that um, uh, police at the time did some things that weren't quite right. Sure. And uh, and, and he just kind of closed up by saying, but that's part of our history, you know? And uh, Like owning it and just saying, yeah, like, just yeah. Own it. Yeah, yeah, we're trying to be better people now. And, and are I was we like, all just wow, trying to be better talk people? about integrity, you know? Yeah. Like, I wish everybody could have heard that conversation. Mm-hmm. And then Mike, interestingly... The next show, the next day, you actually took a little piece of that and played that segment, and you built on that for another segment you wanted to do yeah. about things you remember about KW or something, Highway right. Market and stuff like that. Oh, so, yeah. 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 Those are always the fun shows. Yeah. That's the stuff that you need to do when it gets, you know, heavy at times. Yeah. <laughs> and your Friday four-way panel yeah. is, uh, is excellent. You bring in different guests. What I want to ask about your newspaper column in the Kitchener Post is, this is what I think probably works really well for you is you write a newspaper column which is kind of like writing a little mini essay you have to really think about what you're putting together here in you know eight or nine paragraphs about 500 words right yeah and uh, you have to really craft your thought when writing a column and um so you've done that and then you're on the radio and it's like it's already all there in your head so you sound really really intelligent because you just wrote about it you know what i mean um, do you find that they, they both play beautifully off each other for you? The radio influences the writing and the writing gives it back to you? On the very best weeks. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it's a weekly paper, so I write it weekly. And there are times where I will use interviews from my show on 570 News to support columns I'm writing in the newspaper. But yes, those are, those are the ideal weeks. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say how many times, though, through the course of the year, I struggle. What am I going to write about this week? And, you know, I said earlier on this podcast that there, there's so much going on and we were mandated, self-mandated to do as much local content as possible. But there are some weeks where I'm th- sitting there thinking, yeah, I, I got nothing right now. I, I, you <laughs> know, 500 words, yeah, 500 <laughs> yeah. words is going to be a bit of a stretch. But but yes, the, the short answer, Marshall, would be absolutely. I, I find them complimentary. I find myself some days completely unplanned like nothing on a talk show is ever scripted i don't believe in scripting interviews in advance i have an idea obviously of where i'm going to start but then it's entirely up to the guest i think the best interviewers listen carefully and move their questions based on the responses they get to the questions they've asked so i generally try to do that uh so there are other times where you know you're filling a segment or you know the phones aren't ringing so uh, whatever i might just say something that sparks an idea for myself. Hey, now I'm getting pretty passionate about this. What about this, that, and the other thing? And next thing you know, I think I, I might have a column out of this and I'll shut off the microphone and start scribbling down some thoughts for the next week's paper. I don't think a lot of people really understand just how, you know, live radio, that listening, how important that is. Um, I'll tell you where something doesn't work is, uh, it, you know, when it's not working. So Sarah knows I'm a huge wrestling fan. I like to listen to these old time wrestlers they're called shoot interviews where they basically they have nothing to lose so they just talk about the old days of wrestling and they just say whatever they want right and there's usually some nervous interviewer interviewing them 
and they're not listening to the response because they just have like 50 questions lined <laughs> up. So a wrestler will say something and said, and I never trusted him to begin with, right? <laughs> and then me, I'm going, why, why, why didn't you trust him? <laughs> and the, and the, they just move on. Yeah, no, the interviewer goes, and, and, and when you went to Japan, did you? <laughs> and I'm like, no. Anyways, that, that's per for me has shown me how raw, how messed up. <laughs> what a, that format the is. The format yeah, yeah, yeah. is and how what Mike does is the way you engage listeners and the way you are part of the listeners somewhat an active part of the conversation. I hope so. Yeah. That's the ideal world. Yeah. And uh, whatever is coming at you, you're responding to it like a cause and effect type thing. And uh, what, um, so with the Mike Farwell show, uh, you pretty much you take all these, the skill set that you have and all this life experience. And I've heard the expression, uh, Freddie Eagle Smith, uh, folk singer talks about how a man never really grows up till he's about 40 odd years old <laughs> so i think this is an ama amazing age for you to be i think you resonate with uh callers much older than you as well uh, so, yeah people who listen sorry listeners much older i think you might have uh a career in broadcasting and in management if you've never thought of one Marco, <laughs> because like, <laughs> they, i listen i had i i can remember it like it was yesterday yeah. so i i think as a, a younger person I was like many in their chosen profession and you start out and you pay your dues at the bottom, but you are in one awfully big hurry to get to where you right. want to be, where yeah. you believe you will ultimately be yeah. the faster you get there, the better. And so I had reached a point in my career where I was filling in on talk shows and I, I, started to enjoy it more and more. And then though the impatience in me started getting the better of me. I'm like, I'm, I'm ready to do this. Can't we find a place? I don't want to take away anybody's current job, but couldn't we find something anyway? It, it didn't happen. And, and my boss to his credit at the time said exactly what Marshall was saying. I was still in my thirties and I, I don't mean to be ageist on either end of the spectrum here, no, but he said about your experience, right? Yeah, fair enough. And, and, and he did say, he says, you know what? Um, life experience matters in these roles. You know, once you're divorced and once you've been fired and all these different experience, you know, it just, it just, it changes. It really does. And so now I, I think Marshall nails it. I think I'm in that sweet spot in my late forties now, having lived experience, mm -hmm. uh, having covered news in this community for as long as I have. So it's, it's easier recall to get to details that I need for research purposes, et cetera. Cause I remember council decisions and meetings and different politicians and all of those, those different players that might bring more life to a story. But the, the, the life experience matters immensely, just in, immensely. You can't, you can't replace it. You really can't. That's where I was trying to yeah. go to. I, I think about how Mike has interviewed recently, um, parents of a, of a son who lost his life to an overdose. I just read that article. And, actually. and with each of those interviews, it's, um, it's, it's building up your knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. of things when you're that close to it, when you're looking right into the eyes of these people. It's kind of like it arms you to for the next show and the next 50 shows ahead of you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you, so you've, you've experienced your own suffering and loss in your own life and adversity the way everybody does it's eventually. And then, but all these guests that you've interviewed, you're, you're taking something away from that experience. It's a really positive, uh, empowering thing, I imagine. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about, Sarah, with volunteering. Mm -hmm. It's almost selfish, right? Yeah. Like, I, I get to learn every day. I get to extract stories and knowledge and experiences mm -hmm. from people. And in some ways, as Marshall is saying, kind of make them my own. It, every day, it makes me a better person. Without question, it does. I'm glad you brought it back there because I wanted to wrap up with I don't want to sound like an Instagram or Twitter meme, but it seems to me like Mike Farwell is living his truth. You're, you have found out who you are. You found out what you want to get and give, and it's coming full circle for you. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great way. That's a great way to put it. I, mm -hmm. I am loathe to say it out loud, though I have before, because it is my truth. And, you know, one of two things could happen tomorrow. Uh, that, that bus that's got my name on it could <laughs> run me down, mm -hmm. or the boss that's finally had enough could say, thanks. That's the end. And I would not, I would not regret a thing. Like I have, it's that's just, the whole key. right. Yep. I so incredibly, and I think the word is overused, but I'm going to say it blessed 
and I'm not a deeply religious person at all. Mm -hmm. But I am just, I, I consider myself the luckiest human being alive. I, I know that every single day. And yes, you know, going back to what we were just saying about life experience, uh, being comfortable in my own skin, I'll, I'll be honest about this. It took me a long time. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, did it take me a long time. But once I got there, which probably was... 15 years ago, max, like I'm into my thirties before I really become, I just kind of figure out who I like, I know who I am and I'm going to live like who I am. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's the way I've been ever since. And not a single, not one regret with that. Not one. I've heard, uh, the music scenes and all, the best example I can think of is the, like, let's say the pays the underground music scene in the seventies in California, where all these California girl bands, like the bangles and go, mm -hmm. the go-go's came out of, I've heard it described as kind of it's like a wave coming in from the ocean. It comes in, and then it go, retreats back yeah. out. And I think about how when I think of the Mike Farwell show, I think this incredible wave has come in, and you're just riding it. You know, you're just surfing right on it for as long as you can, and uh, eventually it will retreat, whether it's on your terms or by just the passage of time and all sorts of shifts we can't even see happen for why things don't last forever. And uh, I really feel like you're making the absolute most human being could out of such an incredible run. Uh, I, I thank you for that. And, and I, I'd be lying if I said I don't think about that because I, that's a really just perfect analogy mm -hmm. for where I kind of feel like I'm at and, and the uncertainty of not knowing where it's going. But I'm, I'm very cognizant that this is absolutely some sort of wave. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how I got on the board that got me onto it. But I'm, I'm loving every second of it and, and God willing, because I think it's every person's, it's every musician's dream, I think, every performer's dream. And certainly I've, I've, seen, I've seen the loss in broadcasting absolutely in my time in it. Uh, going out on, on my own terms, I'll pray to whatever gods might be listening that I could do that. That would be, uh, that would be the best. Uh, my family's happy place is the beach. We spend a lot of time at any beach we can. And our favorite part of the beach is shell collecting or treasure hunting. And when you find the best stuff is when that, that wave actually does retreat yeah. and you get to find all the treasures that are left behind, little creatures that are still alive, little things that maybe some plastics or bad things that you should pick up and take to the nearest trash can if we're on the, the Florida coast, on the Gulf Coast there, or um, some of the most beautiful shells that we've ever found. And it's always in that time when that wave retreats. And I think about that with the analogy that you used, Marshall. I think I about all the that. young people who go into uh, broadcasting and journalism in the field that Mike has worked in and how um, if you don't have curiosity, then what in the world is the yeah. point? You know Were what you I mean? listening yeah. to my show the other no. day? No. No, I, I <laughs> actually haven't heard your show for a few days. I went, I spoke. I spoke last week at Conestoga College Yeah. and to a broadcasting class. Mm -hmm. And they didn't ask me a question. Yeah. And I thought, and I mean, listen, I'll be blunt with you. My ego was bruised. I'm like, come on. Like, you got to want to know something. Like, something. I'm standing right here. Yeah. And then I thought about it even more. So I thought, I don't know about you kids and where you think you're headed. Because if you're not curious in this business, and it was a news class. I was yeah. like, if you're not curious, yeah. if you can't ask a question. Yeah. Oh, boy. They'll Snapchat your question later. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> Although it still doesn't happen. Hello, year twos. Where are you? Yeah. You did a coin a phrase today I was listening to that was ridiculosity. Yes, that's my own word. I've made so it up. So that's new now? It's, uh, I'm going to get it in the OED in no time you watch. Ridiculosity. Yeah. yeah. This was ridiculosity fun. It was. It absolutely was. Thank you so much for coming. I feel like I've learned more about myself in this time, selfishly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you both very much for having me. This has been so much fun. Hope you come back sometime. Anytime you ask. Thanks. Special thanks to our sponsor, Wordsworth Books in Uptown Waterloo. Follow Bond Park Podcast on social media to find out how you can enter to win our Wordsworth Books giveaway. Trust me, it's worth it. Find Wordsworth Books online at wordsworthbooks.com or on Instagram at, at wordsworthbooks. That's W-O-R-D-S-W-O-R-T-H books. Now go enter that giveaway. Thanks for meeting us in Bond Park. Please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung.